For centuries, man had dreamt of traveling to the moon. With the Apollo 11 mission, this ancient dream became reality. Man had left the Earth and for the first time set foot on another heavenly body. But without modern scientific knowledge, this achievement of the century would not have been possible. In the 17th century, mathematician and physicist Isaac Newton defined the law of universal gravitation, that every particle of matter attracts every other particle with a certain force which we call gravity. This law also applies to the planets. So what characteristics would a projectile need in order to overcome the Earth's force of gravity? Newton stated that to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air inside a balloon exerts an even pressure on its inner surface. When air escapes through an opening, a force is exerted at the same time on the opposite side of the balloon. This force sets it in motion. A rocket works on the same principle. It's propelled by the pressure of the gases in the combustion chamber. The first reaction propulsion devices were built in China in the 11th century. This scientific knowledge was taken back to Europe by ship. In 1817, the first time rockets were used on a large scale, Copenhagen was totally destroyed. In the late 19th century, scientists discovered that the rocket was the most suitable vehicle for leaving the Earth, but they didn't know what speed it had to attain. French writer Jules Verne came up with an answer. In his science fiction novel, Journey to the Moon, mathematicians calculate the necessary speed at 40,000 kilometers per hour. Thrilling tales about travelling to the moon also impressed 12-year-old Hermann Aubert. Twenty years later, his research provided the basis for man's conquest of space. Born in Hermannstadt in present-day Romania in 1894, in 1913 Hermann Aubert went to Munich following his father's wish that he should study medicine. After World War I, Aubert switched to physics. At the University of Göttingen, he designed his first rocket. In 1923, Obert published his first book, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space. It sparked off a scientific dispute over the possibility of spaceflight. Obert became famous overnight. But Obert lacked the money to implement his theoretical findings. In Germany of the 20s, no one was interested in his rocket plans. American scientist Robert Goddard used Obert's theories to build the world's first liquid propellant rocket. Its launch in 1926 marked the dawn of the rocket age. In the late 20s, Austrian scientist Max Valier carried out tests with the rocket engines developed by Obert and Goddard. In 1928, film director Fritz Lang engaged the services of Hermann Aubert in his film The Woman in the Moon. As an attraction on the day of the premiere, Lang wanted a rocket to take off. During tests, Aubert noticed the spontaneous decomposition of burning droplets. In a rocket engine, the fuel is burnt in the combustion chamber with explosive force. The particles of oxygen only enter the fuel at the moment of ignition. They don't combust normally but burst into smaller droplets. This compressed injection makes the rocket lighter and the mass ratio more favorable. The thrust remains the same. Obert's conical jet formed the basis for all future rocket engines. Together with two engineers, Rudolf Nebel and Klaus Riedel, in 1930, Obert opened the world's first rocket launching site in Berlin. One of his assistants was an 18-year-old called Werner von Braun. But funds were short. In 1931, a resigned Hermann Obert returned to Transylvania. In 1931, the Third Reich was looming. Germany's military leaders now wanted rockets. According to the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was not allowed to manufacture aircraft. But the treaty said nothing about rockets. At first, Nebel refused to cooperate with the Reichswehr. But von Braun gratefully accepted the offer. Born in Poznan in 1912, even as a boy, von Braun dreamt of flying to the moon. In 1930, he went to Berlin to study mechanical engineering and got to know Hermann Aubert. In 1931, he seized the opportunity that presented itself. In 1937, the Reichswehr built a rocket research and testing center at Peenemünde on the Baltic peninsula of Usedom. On the huge site, over 8,000 people worked feverishly on the design and construction of a military rocket. 
Werner von Braun took over the technical management of the project. The armament was going ahead at full speed. Hitler was planning war. The biggest headache for engineers was the combustion process. New injection heads ensured smoother combustion of the liquid fuel and helped to stabilize the flight of the rocket. Analog computers controlled the aero mechanics and ensured aiming accuracy. For seven years, work went on at Peenemünde day and night. Every minor success was achieved at the cost of numerous setbacks. But finally, the great moment arrived. Just after three o'clock on the afternoon of October the 3rd, 1942, the world's first large rocket was launched, Aggregat 4. Weighing several tons, the rocket attained a maximum velocity of five times the speed of sound at a height of over 90 kilometers. In 1942, Germany had been at war for three years. The tide had turned and Hitler's armies were on the retreat. The civilian population was suffering from the massive air raids mounted by the Allies. In the eyes of many, only a miracle could save Germany. It was in this situation that Propaganda Minister Josef Goebbels announced the development of a wonder weapon that would end the war quickly in Germany's favor. Brown gave Goebbels the V2 and the Germans the illusion of final victory. In the last year of the war, the Wehrmacht fired over 1,000 V2s on London. 2,700 people were killed and thousands more injured. But the world's first large rocket was not able to change the course of the war. In May 1945, Germany surrendered unconditionally. The Allies, the V-2 rockets, and the technicians who built them were important booty. The victorious powers decided on the future of Europe. In 1945, American troops transported over a thousand V-2 rockets overseas. Germany's leading rocket researchers changed sides. In the late 40s, the Cold War began. The Pentagon needed a carrier rocket for nuclear payloads. In the mid-50s, in White Sands, New Mexico, Werner von Braun developed the Redstone carrier rocket on the basis of the V-2. It marked the start of an intercontinental ballistic missile race between the superpowers. Once again, von Braun was restricted to building only military rockets, for the time being, that was. But in 1957, the Russians launched the world's first space satellite, Sputnik 1, and Werner von Braun's second outstanding career began. He was commissioned with the further development of the Redstone rocket. Only 80 days after Sputnik 1, the Americans launched Jupiter C. On board was the first US satellite, Explorer 1. The superpowers had also embarked on a space race. On April 12, 1961, a Soviet Vostok rocket carried the first human being into space. With Yuri Gagarin's 90-minute journey, the age of manned spaceflight began. Once again, the Russians had beaten the Americans. Just four weeks later, on May the 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to embark on a brief flight in space. The first space flights by the two superpowers showed that man could meet the demands this placed on him. Tests continued. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because In 1961, are President because John F. Kennedy Michael announced that America would put a man on the moon before the end of the, the decade. Of the Apollo program was born. Because the basis of the gigantic project was the development of a Saturn V launch vehicle with ten times the thrust of the Jupiter C rocket. Werner von Braun's team was commissioned with the task. It opted for the proven modular principle in which several combustion stages had ignited in succession. The first stage had to generate an enormous initial thrust to get the total weight of 2,700 tons airborne. On July the 16th, 1969, the 115-meter-high Saturn V rocket was ready to be launched. The three astronauts entered the space capsule. 
exhausted at a height of 44 kilometers the first stage we're now in the approach phase off. everything looking good the second stage engine took over the task 42, and the go for landing, over. only seven minutes later it too was jettisoned the third stage engine took that. the rocket into orbit around the earth at a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour four forward four forward drift into the right level and after three days in space the astronauts entered orbit, orbit around the moon the lunar module separated from the mothership and descended to the surface of the moon. Seven hours later, a man set foot on another celestial body for the first time. With no wind or weather on the moon, Neil Armstrong's footprints will be preserved for millions of years. Staff at NASA headquarters in Houston were elated. The Americans had achieved their goal, and Werner von Braun was at the pinnacle of his career. After 21 hours and 36 minutes, Armstrong's and Aldrin's visit to the moon was over. The return flight began. The lunar module returned to the mothership. The Earth's gravitational field accelerated the spaceship to a speed of over 40,000 kilometers per hour. The critical phase of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere passed without incident. The command module with its three astronauts splashed down safely. In the years that followed, there were another six missions to the moon. But with costs soaring and public interest dwindling, NASA was no longer able to win political support for its ambitious goals. In 1972, the Americans bade farewell to the moon. The Apollo program was terminated. In 1969, NASA had started planning the next generation of spaceship, the Space Shuttle. This reusable and thus economical space transporter is launched into orbit by a rocket and returns to Earth like an ordinary aircraft. Apollo Houston, it looks like we lost communications with you for a while, but we're back again. Okay, we were getting into uh, Imbo up there, Bo, for some reason. With the help of the Space Shuttle, the Freedom Space Station is to be built before the year 2000. NASA plans to launch a manned flight to Mars from Freedom. Politically and economically, the project remains a bone of contention. The astronauts would be in flight for a total of over three years to try and answer the question of whether life has ever existed on Mars. still not certain what kind of fuel the spaceship would use. The type of propulsion will remain the same. Only Newton's reaction principle makes forward motion possible in the vacuum of space. There's no alternative to one of the oldest technical discoveries.